right, welcome back. So, as I said earlier, no more land, um, at least for now. No more states and land. Um, and in fact, no more land at all. We are back now to personal property, which is what we started out with, right? So we had the easy stuff on the, the bundle of rights, and then we talked about personal property. Um, we said that generally you can acquire title through possession. It's what we started with, or it kind of makes sense how you get property, um, a property relationship in the first place, and that is through um, possession. It's one of the ways you can get it. And so you find something, for example, that is personal property, again, because real property is land and stuff on land, so buildings. Um, personal property is everything else. So you find something, you find an object, you have possession of it, right? Over time, possession is first an interest in itself. It's what we call a possessory interest, which means that you can get back possession if someone takes it away from you, although you do not yet have title. And possession is also a root of title in that over time you can also acquire title when you have possession for a sufficient period of time. All of that was personal property, right? Then we said you can do kind of the same thing with land. You can acquire title through possession, but it's different because there's no such thing as lost land, right? It is land that's owned by someone else, and you can know that by looking up um, the, the, the land in the registry. However, you can still acquire title by possession as you do for personal property through what we call adverse possession, the criteria being somewhat different because you know who the owner is or you can. Then we did all the cool stuff on estates and land, and now we're back to personal property. B building on now, right, the assumption that you have title, however so, right, so you bought it, you got it because someone gave you something or you acquired it by virtue of, right, finding a lost object. So now you have title and you do something with what you have title to, namely give it to someone else. So you give, right, the object to which you have title, not your title, to someone else who then has, right, possession but they have possession because you allowed them to. Not like a lost object, right? A lost object is you have full possession and you have that to the exclusion of the rightful owner and if they don't show up, right, you keep it forever. This is a limited kind of possession that you give someone else for one reason or another, often for, right, a limited period of time. So they either get to use your stuff because you're generous or, right, um, you pay them to have the use of your stuff. For instance, if you go on vacation, that is what we call a bailment. Bailment is you give your stuff to someone else for a limited period of time for some reason, right? Um, that um, can be um, first only for personal property. So if it's your house, it's not called a bailment. So it's only personal property, not land and buildings attached to land. It's something else, right? So a residential lease is a residential lease, not a bailment. And second, it can be gratuitous or not. So it can be for free or for money. And again, there are reasons why you'd want to give your stuff away to someone. Um, for, for free, right? For instance, you want them to try out your car or um, they're, they're being nice to you and they're looking after your um, dog or whatever it is while you're on vacation. They don't charge you any money because they like you. Then you give it to them for free. You can also do it for money. If you don't have any friends, then you'll have to pay someone to look after your dog. Both of these are bailments, right? They are just Different types of bailments. One of them is gratuitous, the other one is not. So for land, as I said, generally will be called a lease, which is a leasehold estate, which we already looked at. Not a life estate, not a freehold estate, which is 
title, it is a um, leasehold estate, which is of a different type, as we said. You don't have the absolute right to assign it to someone and all of that. And one of the significant differences is that it is limited in time. So a life estate is limited in time, of course. It's until you die. But that time limit is variable. So it's uncertain as to timing, but certain as to happening, right? Lease is different. It's certain as to both. It's certain as to timing and happening. It's going to say it's for one year. Once the one year is over, it's over. And so it's a limited period of time that's specifically provided for in the contract. Okay, the, the, the other two things that are important to look at. First, um, the duty of care arising out of a bailment varies. So the obligation that the person to whom you give your stuff to will have will vary depending on the nature of the bailment, which kind of just makes sense, right? Um, if you give your neighbor your dog for two weeks and they're nice enough to do it for free, on top, I, I, dog's probably not the best example because you can't damage a dog. Say it's a table, right? So you give them your table um, for two weeks, right? They're, they're being nice. They are looking after your table for free. Um, and then, right, we won't on top of that expect them to take extraordinary care to ensure that although they're taking care, some third party that comes into their house doesn't damage it, right? It wouldn't be fair. They're already doing it for free. And now on top of that, we'll say they can get sued, right? Which they got no incentive to do, right? People just won't look after other people's stuff if they're, they're being generous. And on top of that, they can get sued. So the nature of the obligation will naturally vary. If it's for free, right? Um, it, it, so if it's, if it's for free, it will be less of a duty of care. You have lots of obligations mentioned in the book, right, from strict liability to all that. Doesn't really apply anymore. Nonetheless, there's still a spectrum. So it's the same duty now, but it applies differently on a spectrum depending on these factors. First, whether it's free or not, right? If you pay, you'll expect a correlative duty. You'll expect them to look after, right, um, thunder, third parties, whatever can happen, not just themselves. Whereas if it's free, you won't. And the second um, thing that you look at is the benefit of the bailment. So if I give my dog to my neighbor and they look at after my dog for a vacation, that is to my benefit is the bailor. Therefore, the obligations will be lower because they're helping me. That's the whole point, right? To the contrary, it can be the opposite. If I give them my car so they can try it out, it is to their benefit, the bailor. So although it's gratuitous there, it's to their benefit because they get to try out my car for free. And then there will be um, higher obligations on the bailee because they personally benefit from um, what is being lended to them. We also have to be careful to differentiate between a bailment and a license because, as we said, a license is not a property interest. A leasehold estate is a property interest, a freehold estate is a property interest, a possessory interest on a chattel, a piece of personal property, is a, 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 a property interest. Title to either real or personal property is a property interest. A license is not. It is a permission to do something, as we said, that would otherwise be illegal. So you get to enter onto someone's property again, gratuitous or not. So barbecue, movie, theater, one of them is free, same thing. You get to show up somewhere where otherwise you would have no right to be because it's not your property, right? And therefore, they can kick you out and call the police. They tolerate your presence, right? for one reason or another. That is a license. It's a lot more limited in scope than a lease, right? Because it's only for, say, one evening. It's not forever, and, um, and it's not so in, in both time and the scope of the rights being provided, it's less significant, far less significant than, um, than an estate. Also far less significant than a bailment, right? If you give the stuff to your neighbor for two weeks, not the same thing as inviting them over for a barbecue. 
they have entire control over it, greater scope of rights, and therefore, right, and, and that's for a less limited period of time, therefore they have certain obligations. So a bailment is a property interest. So there's actual rights, right, and, and the use of that, of course, is that you can sue on them, as we said multiple times. So there's actual rights, um, of and, and, and correlative obligations of the bailee, the person you give your stuff to, therefore that person can sue and be sued. So you have to be careful again, if it's a license, might be different. For example, um, they say it, it comes up the most in, in, in the context of parking lot, which is, um, which is kind of true. Um, if you have a parking lot, you let people use it for free. That might just be a license because it's limited in time. It's limited in the scope of the rights that you allow people to have. Therefore, your obligations are more likely to be limited. There is no need, however, for a bailment to be voluntary. So it can be involuntary. So if you forget your stuff in someone's house, it's a bailment. They have possession of your stuff in your stead, therefore they have certain obligations. In fact, it's the exact same thing as a lost object. We said when you find a lost object, you have certain obligations to the true owner, even though you don't know who they are, and even though they likely will never show up. So you have a duty to, first, as we said earlier in the term, try to find them, and so that there's legitimacy to you getting the property in the end, um, and second, right, you have an obligation to take reasonable care of the thing um, in the meantime so that if they show up, right, you got the use of it, you got a benefit. What's the obligation with that? Well, when they show up, it's likely to be in the same conditions when they lost it. The obligations can, of course, be limited by contract because that's how the law works, right? You have a certain obligation which, which, so certain obligation which applies by default by virtue of the statute or the common law. Here it applies by virtue of the common law, right? The English judges um, over the past couple hundred years made up some rules because they were faced with cases of people, sorry, giving their stuff to other people. And these rules include, right, this varying duty of care. There's nothing that says you can't vary that, right? All the default rules, which the law provides for by statute or by common law, you can vary unless someone says otherwise. So unless the government says this is a public order rule, you don't get to vary it because we don't want, say, poor consumers to get screwed. To the extent that that's not the case, it can be limited by contract, but by contract, right? So if you sign a contract, it's fine, because presumably you got the piece of paper, right? When, when you put your name on it, the assumption is that you had the time to get it, read it, look at it, and then say, right, I fundamentally disagree with how you are limiting the duty of care upon my bailment. Oftentimes there will not be an actual contract, it will be implied. You go to a parking lot, you get a ticket, there's stuff written in the back of it. It kind of is a contract, right? But it's implied. And it's not clear that you agreed to it, right? They put some terms in there, but it's not clear you agreed to it. If you just draw the ticket, it's not clear you agreed to it. If they tell you, read this ticket and, and don't, don't come in if you disagree, then maybe, right, you've agreed to it. If not, it's not clear. So to the extent that it's not clear, you have to prove agreement, right? A contract isn't just someone writes something on a piece of paper, it's also the other party has to agree. Then you have an example with, um, with uh, a parking lot. Um, essentially, right, you have, um, you, you, you have um, a case being appealed at um, first instance, they said, the owner of the parking lot is responsible for the car that was lost. Two issues there. First, are they responsible? And second, are they responsible to the extent that they don't even know what happened, right? So say there's a brick that falls off, right? 
then you know what happened, and you can tell it's the parking lot's fault because the brick fell from their parking lot. If one of their employees goes joyriding, again, it is the fault of the, um, of the parking lot, um, of, the, of, of the people who own the parking lot. Therefore, you can impose an obligation. Here, you don't know what happened to the car. So that's an added level of complexity. First, you have certain obligations being, um, being provided for, right? But there is no contract. They just put a waiver on there. And then the question is, right, did they agree and was that sufficient to exonerate them? And the short answer is no. You have first to characterize the nature of the right. So is it a bailment or a license? Well, here it is a license because they got the keys of the car, which is control, which means they have exclusive control over the car for a period of time. Again, the extent of the rights in the time period point to the fact that it is more than a mere license. On top of that, they get paid for it, right? And the various other contextual factors would point you to the fact that they have to take um, proper care. What I do want to draw your attention to is the presumption that arises out of the case. So, to the extent, right, that you're faced with a case is what I stand, where it's not clear what happened, where you can't tell how the car was damaged. The rule says it doesn't matter. There's a presumption that the bailee, the person being given this stuff, is responsible because they're getting paid. The way that presumption operates is their obligation is, by default, not to take reasonable care only. It is to deliver the stuff. So they have an obligation of result to deliver the stuff upon your right, coming back from, say, your vacation. So what's that mean? Well, it means if they don't, they are at fault. So that creates a presumption. You don't have to know what happened. If it happened, and you know it did because they don't have the stuff, then the presumption is that that issue that's fault is being imputed to them. However, that's misleading because the presumption can be rebutted by showing reasonable care. So that presumption of fault, which does apply, they don't rebut by saying, well, we looked into it and we, find, we found out what happened. Here's why it's not our fault. So they don't have to figure out what did happen to rebut the presumption. They just have to show they took reasonable care. Again, upon the varying standard that applies. So that might be a lot of care, might be a little care, depending on the nature of right, the bailment. So whether it's for free, for money, who would benefit, all that. Then they'd have to show they took, they met that duty of care. So they don't have to show where the car went. They don't have to show what happened to it. They just have to show, say, that they right, hired smart people, locked the doors at night, whatever it is. Okay, then there are two additional um, minor issues um, which I'm running out of space for, um, but we'll call them the content of the car, right? So when there's stuff in the car, are they responsible? The answer is no. They're responsible for what they can reasonably expect to be in the car or whatever the stuff that you're lending is, right? So they can expect that there will be stuff in the car as there is in a typical car that they're responsible for. If you have lots of expensive stuff in your car, they have no notice of that unless you tell them, therefore they're not responsible. If they lose a car, they're not responsible for the content of the car because they did not know, right, and in fact could not know what was in there unless you told them. And, right, there's also an issue as to 
um, defect. And that's really a permutation of the duty of care. So sometimes, as the person lending the stuff, you will have, um, you will have certain responsibilities. So as someone, right, it's kind of a different example from what we said earlier. It's not just you, right, lending your car while you're on vacation. Say you go to a car rental company. Well, then you are paying the car rental company, but they're the one giving you the car. And so you benefit. When they're giving you something, because you're paying them, again, depending on who benefits and, and, and whether it's, it's gratuitous or not, the obligation is correlative to that. So they'll have an obligation to make sure that the car that you're paying for, right, which is again a bailment, just opposite way, it, it works because you're giving them money. To the contrary, if someone lends you their car for free, they won't have an obligation to ensure that it works, right, because they're doing that for free, or at least the obligation will be much lower, generally having to do with hidden defects, right? So they'll just have to make sure it doesn't blow up on you in a way that you had absolutely no way to expect. Um, then you have a couple issues um, which are worth mentioning briefly, not that important for our purposes. First, there are two industries where historically you've had um, greater liability. That's what we call common carriers, which just means transportation essentially and inns, which just mean hotels, essentially. So historically, you had strict liability. So liability, again, regardless of fault, regardless of the amount, for the people who transport your stuff and for the people who house you. The inns obligation no longer applies because it was altered by statute. The common carrier obligation does, but most of the time, right, the company will be smart enough, almost always in fact, and alter the ad by contract, which again, you're allowed to do. Last thing that's mentioned, page 409, that was 408, right, um, is that you don't have an obligation for a bailment to be personal. In other words, right, unless it's prohibited, the person to whom you are giving your stuff, the bailee, can sub bail it, so can task someone else to take care of it, right, unless that's prohibited by contract. And we will get back to that next week.